Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is New Canaan Library's author talk with Michelle Zauner, who will discuss her memoir, Crying in H Mart. I thank you all for coming. My name is Laura Cavers. I'm the reader advisor at New Canaan Library, and I'll be your host tonight. And that's it. And we'd like to start the show. Hi, Michelle. Uh, Michelle Zauner visits us tonight to discuss her breakout bestseller, Memoir Crying in H Mart. It's part of Food Blog, part Grieving Daughter. Her memoir is a moving coming of age story about mothers and daughters, love and grief, loyalty, and the sumptuous mouthwatering Korean cooking that kept them close. Michelle is best known as a singer and guitarist who creates a dreamy shoegaze inspired indie pop under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has won acclaim from major, major music outlets around the world for releases like Psychopomp in 2016, Soft Sounds from Another Planet in 2017, and most recently, Jubilee 2021. Her memoir, Crying in H Mart, is her first book and a New York Times bestseller. And I'm happy to report Japanese Breakfast has received a Grammy nomination for the 2021 awards show coming up. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for being with us tonight. And a big congratulations for your Grammy nomination. Thank you. So um, for those of us who have not, uh, I'm going, I hope I can show this oh, with the screen behind me, my green screen, it won't show. Do you have your book with you just to show the cover? There it is. Thank you. Um, for those who have not yet read the book, can you please, you know, tell us what is an H mark and why is this title significant to your memoir? Um, H Mart is a Korean supermarket chain, uh, and they are usually in, I guess, like more urban areas uh, that have larger Asian populations. Um, and it's where I found myself uh, around this time, maybe uh, five years ago, two years after my mother passed away, eating uh lunch by myself, uh, missing her. Uh, my mother passed away in, in 2014 uh, to cancer. And I think I just wanted to feel close to her. And so I found myself in this H Mart food court observing other people, curious if they were sort of um, reaching for or searching for a similar kind of uh, feeling. Um, and I found myself learning how to cook Korean food and um, connecting with my Korean culture as, as a big part of my grieving process and, and sort of returning to the supermarket over and over again. Uh, earlier, you and I talked about a, um, a uh, mutual friend that we have that we know and, um, and that when I was reading your memoir, I was sort of reliving stories that I had kind of already heard about. And it's the, this person was actually, uh, you were at Bryn Mawr and he was at another school in Philadelphia, also in the music in, you know, music scene. I want you, you know, that's such an interesting part of your story is in Bryn Mawr, you uh, really took off in wanting to do this uh, musical groups. Was it, did you know that this was where you were going to go or was it just pure uh, experimentation at a fun time in college and that's all that it was? Can you just say a little about that? Uh, yeah, I started playing music when I was in high school, when I was 16. And I think I always identified as um, an artist or I, I, I wanted so desperately um, to create something that meant as much uh, to other people um, as the sort of music and literature that I was consuming at that age. Um, but, you know, it, my, because of my upbringing, it, it didn't really ever seem like a, a viable option. It was always something that my mother really felt I needed to have um, something to fall back on in case that didn't work out. Like most parents probably would, encourage and 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 feel um but certainly when i you know went 
for, there was a time that I, I didn't really want to go to college because I really wanted to pursue uh, my music and, and playing in bands. Um, but, you know, I ultimately wound up at Bryn Mawr. My, my parents were very adamant about me going to college and, and ultimately I'm very glad that I went to college. Uh, and I had a wonderful education that I think uh, played a, a, a huge role in, in the writing of this book and, and the way that I read and, and write now. Um, but yeah, I, music was always my passion, even in college. And so I was always pursuing it on the side, always hoping that it would uh, be successful enough uh, for me to make a living out of. Uh, and that was when I met Kevin O'Halloran, who's Peggy's son, who <laughs> is on the chat. And uh, yeah, Kevin was a huge part of my life and was also so passionate about music and the two of us really encouraged um, each other and played in a band together for I think three or four well we had our college band for I think two or three years and then we played in another band together after college uh, for two or three to four years I think and so yeah he was a big part of my my musical life and I, I spent many great times with uh with the O'Hallorans and I'm, I'm happy to see Peggy in the chat <laughs> Well, I know I, we we enjoyed all of Peggy's uh, talks about um, because none of our kids were so creative that uh, you know it was just uh, when we would all get together it was just really wonderful to hear these mm -hmm. stories and I read about them you know in a you know in a reserved sort of way it was sort of a side story I could sort of I could feel a framework in your memoir things that I had heard so it was it was delightful in that way. Um, so one thing that you also loved about your, in your memoir is that you picked up a plastic, was it a toy guitar? And how old were you when you were doing that? And you actually played it uh, a lot. You took lessons with it, or you even went into a competition or a, uh, wasn't that something like that? A very, very, very um, inexpensive guitar when you were younger? Um, I did not receive a guitar until I was 16. Um, and my mom bought me a, a Yamaha acoustic from Costco that was $100. Um, oh, okay. It wasn't, so, it wasn't a toy. It was just a, a very see. like cheaply made guitar. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I, I took lessons on that for a brief period of time, I think, before uh, the guitar teacher was like, this is unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part of the story. I'm sorry that I was thinking of it as something toy-like, but I think possibly because the the uh, teacher was just like, uh, no, you need something much more than this, uh, that I was thinking it was some, and your determination also that you talked about, you know, wanting to play this guitar and be in the competition and, or it was a, I don't know if it was competition or a recital, but you performed with it. And anyway, I just love that seeing that in such a young person to know that, that this was what they liked. Now you were right, you know, you said that your mom thought that this was a passing fancy of yours, just a phase, your music, and that it wouldn't last. Uh, so I was just wondering what, you know, you had said she wanted you to have a career to something to fall back on in case this didn't work out. Well, obviously this is working out. What do you think she'd be saying to you today? Oh, I think that she would be very proud of me, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those, this year has brought in uh, some of the, the highest forms of recognition that, that right. a human being can encounter. So uh, it's, it's a very sweet feeling. Uh, it's a, it's a bittersweet feeling knowing that she, she would be very, very proud of me and, uh, but, but can't be here to see it. But I, yeah. I, I feel in some way that she has led me to this place. Yeah, yeah. It does feel that way, how you describe your mom um, and, and how in your younger age, in your teenage years, which are typically rebellious, uh, but you really get hard on yourself about being rebellious um, and, uh, and, and that you also were, and for a while, not wanting to let people know of your Korean heritage, you just wanted to be white. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Because you also, throughout the whole memoir, you are always sort of wanting to talk about this desire to find yourself. And, um, and I just found, is this like 
part of that? That was like the start of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in, a, in a, I believe, a 95% Caucasian uh, city. Mm -hmm. You know, it was there was not much diversity in, in Eugene, Oregon, which is a college town two hours south of Portland. And, um, you know, I, I think like most teenagers, uh, if there is something that marks you as, as visibly other or, or different from your peers, it, it's, in, it's incredibly embarrassing or, you know, in, in a way that is so exaggerated um, because you just want so desperately to fit in at that age, you know? And I think that it was just, um, I was very uncomfortable with the idea that people were able to assume things about my person without getting to know me that I would never be looked at as like a neutral body I would always be um, an Asian woman and that came with certain stereotypes and I think part of me just really uh, I didn't want to be associated with that or I felt this lack of control um, with that experience and so I, I and I think you know also being mixed race and being half white and growing up in America it, I didn't have any Korean friends and I, I didn't really have anything that made me feel like I um, really identified with this thing that I felt everyone identified me as um, and so that was really difficult uh, in my teenage years and I think I I was uh you know, just, I resented that. And I, I'm, I'm sure I took it out quite a bit on my mother. And, um, you know, it took getting older and, and becoming more comfortable with who I was as a person and, and understanding how that culture fit into my life um, to kind of return to it in this way. And I think after my mom passed away, I realized uh, how, how connecting to that part of my culture made me feel closer to her and and just how huge of a part of my life it really was and kind of found myself rushing back to it um, in the last six years or so. Mm. Um, and you're in the book, um, like it was every two years your mom brought you back to Korea because she wanted you to know the culture, the heritage, and especially to meet her family. Um, and um, can you just tell me some of the experiences that you had there, um, like your first impressions, like when you first went to Korea, what were some of your first impressions being there? Um, well, I was born in Seoul and we visited uh, her family every other summer for six weeks. And so growing up in a small town in Oregon uh, and then visiting such a large uh, city in, in Korea, was it was such a, exciting experience for me as a young kid. And I think from an early age, I became very comfortable with travel and, um, you know, not speaking the language and, and different types of food. And, and that was a real uh, privileged upbringing in, in retrospect. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just adored uh, visiting Korea because, you know, I was, I was quite lonely in Oregon living out in the woods and, and, you know, I couldn't, I lived kind of outside of town. And so I wasn't able to like ride my bike to like any convenience stores, which seemed like the ultimate independence. And, uh, you know, I was an only child and, and had a very small nuclear family. And in Korea, I had, you know, two aunts and a cousin and a grandmother that were all, you know, packed together in this little apartment, this three bedroom apartment. And so, I was just delighted and, and adored uh, my time there. I adored my relatives. I adored the city and just being in an urban environment and getting to you know visit all these restaurants and have great food and get to walk to the grocery store and <laughs> and even beyond just like being in in another country. Just I I think be, feeling like I was in a big city was really exciting for me. It was just the total opposite of of my life at home. Oh, I I um. I love your uh, interactions and I'm, it, was it your cousin? Um, so I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name, but he was uh, very influential in um, taking you around to Korea away from the aunts. Uh, just what was it like? Was it a really big independence? Did you really feel, um, I don't know, just totally set free? Yeah, my cousin's name was Sung Young, and mm -hmm. I think that he was probably like six years older than me, I would oh, say. Okay. Yeah. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, at that age, like, you know, I, I was such a lonely only child that having uh, this kind of like older brother figure was, I was just obsessed with him, you know, because I, I never, uh, you know, had like proximity to someone like that in my life. And so I just really uh, adored him and, and clung to him. Uh, and, and he was very generous uh, with his time and would take me out to like, arcade you know all the stuff that your like parents don't really want to do with you like he would take right. me out to arcades and like play games with me and we'd watch cartoons together and he'd show me all the like cool k-pop bands that he was into and right. we'd draw together and uh watch you know like he'd show me the cool new cartoons and comic books and so all the things that I I never had like an older um figure that was also close to me in age to kind of look after me to like have that in my life was really uh exciting at that age I think and how lucky you were because there are so many times like, you know, someone of your mom's age or of that generation, they have a vision of what is to be seen in Korea. And so how wonderful for you to have this cousin to take you to something that they may not know anything about right, right. and give you that that great experience. So it was it was it was fun to read about that. So this is this memoir of yours is written like a food blog. I mean, very sumptuous kinds of uh, creative writing that uh, it just made me so hungry and wanting to, first of all, I didn't know how to pronounce most of the words <laughs> <laughs> that you were spelling with, you know, double Fs and two, you know, two G. Like, what is this? I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> it was, it was, but sumptuous words, um, mouthwatering descriptions, fluid style of writing. So it felt like I was watching you stirring. Uh, watching you fold the food into the recipes uh, in front of my eyes. Um, and so I actually have a favorite recipe that was actually while your mom was ill, one uh, Kai or uh, K, -K. K made a lovely um, something that made your mom finally eat after she had the cancer, she wasn't eating well. And she was able to create the Korean foods that would make her want to eat. And um, so this is just an example. And I'm letting everyone know the wonderful writing that you do here and why this is sort of like a food blog. And we'll just, uh, I just want to go, go out to dinner now. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. In the evening, Kai used our rice cooker and made homemade uh, yaksik. Uh, yaksik. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she mixed rice with local honey, soy sauce, and sesame oil, adding pine nuts, pitted jujubes, raisins, and chestnuts. She rolled the mixture out on a cutting board and divided the flattened cake into smaller squares. Fresh out of the rice cooker, it was steaming and gooey. The colors were golden and autumnal. The jujubes, a rich, dark red, the light beige chestnuts framed by the bronze caramelized rice she brought it to my mother in bed with a mug of barley tea <laughs> I just want to go eat now I mean so I'm letting everyone know I mean that yes this is I mean this is such a lovely story a mother daughter uh connecting through food uh um and um and it's it is your love of, of the food is definitely resonating in your memoir. Um, when you would make food with your mother, um, were you talking in this way or was there still that rebellious friction and it was only when she was sick and, and you were trying to care for her that you felt the importance of understanding all of this and all of a sudden it started to resonate and become the colors that you bring into the book. I'm just curious. Um, I think that my mom and I always enjoyed eating food together. I mean, I think that she was uh, a bit of an epicure. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that food for her was always some type of celebration. You know, she never, um, I mean, I'm sure that there were times that she looked at it as a chore, but for us, I feel like it was always, you know, an inspired uh, activity where, you know, we would you know, oh, you know what I feel like today? Like a patty melt, like let's go get a patty melt. Or like, oh, yeah. oh, you know what I feel like today? Like uh, pulling out the barbecue and like doing like pork belly with like fresh lettuce. And uh, mm. she was very like, 
she allowed her like moods to sway us. And every time we ate, it kind of like felt like an event or um, something to look forward to or, or prepare. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like that was a, a thing that I, I got from her and I, I still I still feel that way. Um, and yeah, that was definitely a, a point of bonding. And, and certainly when we went to Korea, um, I felt that she was very proud of me, especially when I enjoyed the same kind of Korean food as she did. It was kind of like one of those moments where you look at your kid and you're like, that one's mine, you know? Oh, you like that? It's like, it's cause I like that. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think I just, you know, um, I think my mom was someone that could be sort of difficult to please. And, uh, you know, I talk about this in the book, but I, I think that became uh, a way that I felt um, I could please her and it, and it was easy for me, you know, like I, I enjoyed these dishes and I, we could enjoy them together and she enjoyed that I enjoyed it. Um, so I think it was always a kind of connection that we had and a very natural place for me to return to after she passed away to kind of uh, remember her by. Yeah. And so it was even beyond food. I mean, tell us more about your mom. Like she was really very, um, she was uh, fashionable and, uh, very much want very current um tell us more about your mom more than just about the food yeah my mom was um she loved fashion she loved interior decorating um she was a very charming woman had a very magnetic uh personality she could uh win people over very easily i think um and and had a very like personal touch in the way that she interacted with other people and, and, and a way of inviting you in and making you uh, feel included. Um, and I think that in, you know, she would always be the most like stylish woman uh, in Eugene, Oregon. And she had a very particular style where she wore these kind of like big faux fur vests and like always, she loved a, a stylish watch. She loved a big <laughs> handbag and she loved huge sunglasses. Um, and she was very composed. She looked like, you know, she could own something for, you know, 20 years and it looked like it, she'd never worn it before. Uh, she carried herself with a lot of confidence. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, later on, the more I, I, I've sort of investigated her as an adult and, and after she's she's been gone, you know, I think that she was also someone that was, um, very moved by it, by ordinary things. I think that she had some some sensitivities. Uh, she she experienced things very very deeply and and had a kind of poetic way about like the way that she observed people and and um, felt things. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your your dad takes a quiet role in your in your memoir. Um, I read other articles. There's a bit of estrangement, but the articles were old um, and, you know, how's dad, how is he today? Um, I think he's fine. We are unfortunately uh, still pretty estranged. He lives in, in Phuket with uh, a, a new family. So um, I, I don't keep in touch with him too often. Mm. Um, so the book started as an essay uh, that you wrote and I believe it was in the New Yorker magazine that um, it appeared. Uh, what was your inspiration for writing that essay? And then how did it become the book? I actually had already started the book um, before the essay was published and, and Crying in H Mart was always the first chapter. Uh, I had started writing the book in 2018 after a, a tour that my band did in Asia and, and I stayed behind in Seoul for six weeks and started writing what I, I thought uh, could be a book about this experience. And um, my label, funny enough, connected with me with someone at the New Yorker and I sent in the first mm -hmm. chapter as a standalone essay and it just uh, blew up, you know, and it, oh. it, it resonated with many people and um, I, I had many meetings with agents and uh, about turning it into a book and, and that sort of set me on this path to, to, to completion. And so there's an interesting, you, you, um, you have a food blog or you did do a food blog about my, you know, with food and migration. 
Mm. And then also through with this book, you're also talking about being of mixed race and sort of talking about that. Has that become something more and more important each year that you feel you have become a spokesman for? Um, I did a show with Vice uh, about food and migration and specifically kind of natural types of fusion foods like how there's a cuisine called Nikkei cuisine that has um, uh, came from Japanese immigrants who lived in South America and, and became the sort of natural uh, sort of Latin Asian fusion that is really delicious. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was asked to kind of host that show for a brief period of time. And I think that they naturally thought of me because of my essay. Um, I, I certainly am, am reticent to take the title of spokes of, of mixed race spokesperson, <laughs> um, but I, I have really appreciated, um, you know, the community that's that's uh, found uh, common ground with this book. Uh, I, I, you know, spoke at my alma mater uh, yesterday, actually, and um, it was really a wonderful experience having so many mixed race kids say to me they felt seen for the first time or that they could see that what their relationship was like with their parents for the first time or you know that they also had a tumultuous teenage years and and so much of that was rooted in their discomfort with their mixed identity um so i i am also very grateful to be in the position where i think i've brought some representation to uh people with mixed race heritage that kind of feel on the uh like they're straddling some type of line. Mm -hmm. um, when you wrote the book, did you feel it doing something for you? Um, and, and then these years later, has the book still done things for you? Yeah, I mean, the, this book certainly has changed my whole life. Um, you know, the response to this book has, has certainly changed my whole life. But you know, writing that I, I feel like I have such a deeper understanding of myself and of my parents and of that particular experience of caretaking for six months of illness of grief. Yeah. Um, but in particular of my mother and I's relationship, which is, you know, the heart of the book, it's, it's really a love letter to her. And I think that I was able to, um, you know, really investigate so much of my memory and, and uh, our relationship and, and discover things that I didn't really I don't think I knew before I, I started writing it. So it was a wonderful experience. So you have the Grammys to go through. <laughs> uh, Jubilee has come out. Um, what is your next creative endeavor? Will it be writing or will it be music or, or even something else? I mean, are you already onto a project right now? Yes, yeah, so Crying in H Mart was optioned uh, to become a feature oh. film with uh, MGM Zorion, and I am yeah. supposed to be writing the screenplay. So my next project will be writing the Crying in H Mart screenplay for film. Wow. Do you have any idea when that may be out in to view? Do you know? Is there a timeline? I think that it's a it's a very long time from now. I have to write the <laughs> screenplay. I have to gather funding and shoot the movie and get people attached to it. So I, I think it's a, it's a long ways down the line, but it's 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 slowly progressing. Wow. Well, Aaron, here's another congratulations to you. <laughs> <laughs> there certainly is a lot. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm now going to ask if anyone has questions from the audience. And um, I see that we have two right now, but please feel free to type into the Q&A any questions that you have. Um, and so the first question I have for Michelle is from Sandra. Uh, were your parents born in Korea or the USA? Were you raised in a traditional Korean home? I think. Um, so my father is American. He was born in Bristol, PA and uh, grew up in New Hope. My mother was born and raised in Seoul, Korea. And they met uh, there when they were in their mid twenties. My dad sold cars to the US military and she worked at the hotel where he stayed. And they went on to travel for, I think five years or so to different army bases in, in Misawa, Japan and Heidelberg. And then when they returned to Seoul, Korea, I was born. 
And we immigrated to Oregon when I was uh, a year old to Eugene, Oregon. Um, I wouldn't say I, I grew up in a traditional uh, Korean household. I think that, you know, by nature of growing up in America in a, in a, in a mixed race uh, household, it was, I don't think that it was very traditional, but my, my mom, I'm sure held some traditional Korean values that, that felt foreign to me. <laughs> I'm, I am curious the 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 super the house that you grew up in it was way out in the uh, uh, you know out of town so that you were quite isolated um, do you know why your parents chose that 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 location or uh, yeah I mean they were able to get like a big beautiful house with um, acreage you know it was like five acres of land and uh, there was like privacy and I think that you know they they could just um, I don't know like what I think it was mostly like my father that that wanted that like he he wanted to be able his big thing was like I want to be able to like walk naked outside <laughs> like if I want to uh that was like a weird big thing for him um not that he like did that often but like he wanted that like he wanted to be able to do that um and yeah I mean I think you know it wasn't like it wasn't like I grew up completely secluded. Like it was, it was like seven miles outside of town. It was, it was like maybe a, like a 15 to 20 minute drive to like the city center. But I think it just felt like so isolating as a, as a kid and especially as an only child to not grow up with many neighbors, to not be able to walk to school or a park or a convenience store. I felt very stranded there growing up. And I think uh, when I was writing the book, I kind of came to realize like how much that really impacted my relationship with my mom and I, because I think a lot of the times I spent so much time with her because she was a homemaker and we were sort of stuck in this house in the woods together that we were a lot of the times one another's only companion because my dad was at work. And I think that that had a lot to do with um, both how close we were and how often we would kind of be at each other's throats. <laughs> There's also some, and it's just a pop psychology that I've sort of heard as parents that, you know, sometimes if you're totally impacted all the time with stimuli, stimuli. Um, it's when you get those quiet times that you begin to uh, know yourself, that you begin to have your inner dialogue inside your, your own head. And maybe that is something that has made you so creative and, and right now so very you know successful and revered and all that. You've had a lot of internal dialogue. So uh, maybe that was a really great, um, great thing that your dad did. I think so. in a big house. <laughs> Christina is asking, I'm curious to know if Michelle had a journal as a young person. Yeah, that's a great question. My mom actually made me keep a diary when I was very young. Uh, that was a big thing that she, I think she must've read somewhere that that was good for kids. And, and you know, so I would write like a couple of sentences of just like, I went to feed the birds at the park today. Uh, but, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't keep a diary. I mean, I, I, I had bouts where I kept diaries here and there, but I wasn't, um, as avid of a, of a journalist as I, I, I wish I had been, would have made writing this book much easier if I had uh, more of that to return to. But uh, I, I, that is my, my resolution for next year is, is to, to start keeping a diary because I think that um, it's a great thing for writers to keep diaries and, and uh, especially nowadays where no one writes anymore or writes mm. particularly letters or anything. I think just getting into the habit of, of thinking in this particular way is really helpful for your writing and, and something I wanna make sure to get into next year. Andrea, oops, someone has just put in. He just wanted to write Andrea. Andrea is asking, do you have cousins here in the States and are you close? Um, I do have some cousins in the States. I have uh, uh, my cousin Anna and McLean who are my father's older brother David's children that actually live in New York. And I, I, I see and, and chat with Anna every so often. And then I have, um, my cousin Sarah and Eli, who are my younger, my dad's. Yes, I have cousins. In this state. <laughs> you have uh, the extended like, family. Hang out, close like, very, we're not super super close, but uh, I I do keep in touch with them, and yeah, they, they have been in various parts of my life. Uh, Judith asks about your writing process. How do you how do you sit down to write? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it changes over time uh, in varying stages of the writing process. But um, one way I got started was uh, when my editor told me that they, they wanted to see 90,000 words for this book. I wrote, wow. I tried to write a thousand words every day um, until I hit it. Uh, and so, you know, it was a it was a kind of exercise in forgiveness of just letting a lot of terrible writing just flow out of you, a lot of stream of consciousness kind of writing. And then once I hit 90,000, I had to do the very difficult job of reading it all the way through and seeing what stuck, you know, but it really helped me find a lot of the raw source material and start kind of thinking about it, uh, forming a sort of arc. And then, you know, it was just revision, 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 finding, finding what's important, going, leaving, coming back, discovering what's not and taking it out and writing some more. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a long, long back and forth. It is a long back and forth process. Um, so now we're asking about your music career. How are you balancing your music career with your book career? And when do you sleep? <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm, well, Peggy's son, Kevin, uh, it helps me balance my music and uh, writing <laughs> career quite well. Uh, we have a pretty like hectic uh, Google Sheets document that uh, makes me live my life from cell to cell. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 easier in some way because you know I I think that I. I mean, I love this lifestyle a lot more than working in nine to five, you know, working work is just difficult no matter what it is, but I think it's, it's easier if you really enjoy what you do. And um, I guess I'm just, I'm just kind of running to keep up right now and, mm -hmm. and trying to, to hold on to two things that I cherish and, and, and do my best uh, at, at the two tremendous gifts that they've given me this year. Um, and yeah, I try to sleep uh, as best I, I can. <laughs> <laughs> what advice this is from Rachel what advice would you give to someone wanting to learn how to play guitar with a hearing impairment I hear sounds all of the time and sometimes get in my head about it you are such an inspiration I am mixed race also and your book has helped helped me heal yeah um you know, I, I'm I'm not sure how to answer that question, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I have no idea what it's like to be hearing impaired and 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 the the difficulties that that might bring to learning a new instrument. But I wonder if um, you know, like, you could look into some some type of teacher that can help with that. I, I I'm I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I, I think it's worth a try. I mean, like you know, famously Beethoven had. Uh, hearing impairment towards the end of his life and um, managed to, I think, like sense the vibrations. And um, yeah, I, I wonder uh, if there are tools that could be used or, or, or teachers that could help uh, you with that. Can you tell, oh, here's more about your, oh, between writing and songwriting. Can you tell us about your writing process uh, for songwriting versus essays. What do you do when you have writer's block and who are your main writing inspirations? This is from Hanson. Um, I think that, you know, this practice of um, like these forced assignments for yourself uh, is really helpful for writer's block. So, you know, forcing yourself to write a thousand words, even if they're really bad uh, and, and hoping for the best that something, even if it's just a sentence comes out of that. Um, I did the same kind of thing with music uh, for the beginning of this project, Japanese Breakfast. I wrote and recorded songs every day for the month of June and, and I had 30 songs uh, that were not great, but offered some raw source material to return to and ended up on a lot of the Japanese Breakfast discography, um, songs that are revisited, it was very helpful. So I think creating sort of these like very specific assignments for yourself and holding yourself accountable to that um, is really helpful. Be it like, I'm gonna lock myself in a cottage for two days and I have to leave with an album or I have to leave with an essay or I have to leave with this things like that I find to be really helpful for me. Um, writers that I, I loved uh, and, and love are uh, Richard Ford and Raymond Carver, Laurie Moore, Marilyn Robinson, uh, John Updike, Philip Roth, uh, Joan Didion, 
uh, those were some of my main sources of inspiration for this book. When writing Crying in H Mark, did you write it from beginning to end in order, or did you write chapters, parts, and then decide the flow afterwards? I think that, um, you know, I had a, a vague outline in mind and I, and I did try to, I think I did at one point try to write sort of beginning to end, but it, it changed so much over time, you know, certain chapters were deleted altogether. Some of them got switched around. Um, new ones are created to go in between chapters or a new ending was created. Uh, I feel like it, it um, changed a lot over the revision process, but I might have started to set out from kind of beginning to end and started jumping around from chapter to chapter once the general kind of scaffolding was up. Uh, what is your favorite Korean meal and what dish would you recommend for a Korean food newbie? Um, I guess my, my like, favorite Korean meal is, uh, is a jjigae, which is a type of Korean stew. It's just a very um, savory, uh, hot, spicy stew that's called kimchi jjigae. And it's like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's eaten a lot in Korea. Uh, I think, you know, a Korean barbecue or bibimbap is like a good beginner's uh, entry point for uh, Korean food. And, and um, if you're feeling slightly more adventurous, there's a Korean Chinese fusion that I really love. Uh, dishes like jampong, which is like a spicy seafood noodle soup, and jajangmyeon, which are uh, black bean noodles, are, are really great if you're feeling uh, like you want something that isn't Korean barbecue or bibimbap. Mm. So here's kind of a long message. Nice to hear that you were at Bryn Mawr yesterday speaking with students. There are two moms of uh, current Haverford juniors listening to you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so eloquent, a model alum, bravo. Did you write a thesis in college? And do you write your own music? Um, I, so my thesis, um, I was actually planning on being an English major uh, at Bryn Mawr and then I became terrified uh, by the idea of having to write a thesis and also realized uh, that I really loved my creative writing courses more than my English courses. And so I created an independent major in, in creative writing and film studies and proposed that for my thesis, I wrote a collection of short, I write a collection of short stories and uh, adapt one of them into a short film. And so my thesis was uh, a collection of three short stories and uh, a short film. And Julie goes on, uh, who had asked that first question. She also goes on, your book resonates with me. I find myself standing in the aisles of H Mart, sometimes close to tears, thinking of my mom. Mm. No, she also has had that same experience. So uh, Vicky is asking, what is more difficult? writing music or writing books? Uh, I found writing a book to be much more challenging than writing music. I don't know if it's because at this point I have so much more experience writing music than I do writing uh, prose in this way, um, or that there, it's a very insular and, and lonely uh, and solitary activity. And I think that music has more room for collaboration. And um, yeah, so I, I find writing uh, the book much more difficult than writing music. Andrea is asking if you have been back to Korea since your mom has passed. Yes, I have um, a, quite a few times. I'm really lucky that I, after, after my mom passed away, I, I went on honeymoon there and, and spent some time with her older sister, Nami, who um, is, is in the book quite a bit. Uh, and since then, my band has uh, got had the chance to, to perform there a couple of times. And I've also uh, gone back a couple of times to work on the book. And so I've, I've spent quite a bit of time after she passed away there. And, and, and I'm sure part of the reason is because I, uh, I feel close to her when I'm there and, and I was, I was particularly spending time with her older sister, my, my aunt Nami. And what books are you reading at the moment? I am currently reading um, a graphic novel 
by Alison Bechtel, who did Fun Home, uh, her new book called A Guide to Superhuman Strength, which I have been really enjoying. And I'm also reading Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, and it's an attempt to kind of be inspired by uh, like the, by plays as I begin to write the screenplay. Right. So I have one last, it's not a question, but it's just something from Peggy O'Halloran. Oh, good, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> she says, no question, Michelle, just want to tell you, big Kevin and I love you and are so proud of you and so no. very happy you and young Kevin are still connected. Happy life. No, oh, I'm very glad too. I'm I'm very, very happy to uh, have all of you in, in my life and, and so grateful that, that Kevin and I are still working together and I miss you both and, and I can't wait to see you guys again. I hope you had a wonderful time in, in Austin. And so I think I'm just going to end it with this nice thank you from an attendee. Thank you, a pleasure to listen to this conversation. Congratulations to Michelle, can't wait to read the book. We've inspired her. That's good. Oh, good. We'll look for her for your band's music. The yellow background with art is so beautiful. That is your, that is your apartment there. Yes, this is my apartment. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so so much. I I it was wonderful reading your book again. Everyone crying in H Mart. Lovely, lovely story about love, loss. Um, understanding, finding oneself. It's a, it's a lovely book. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. Everyone, good night. Everyone have a very nice evening and we will see you again another time. Oh, hey, next week is the Holiday Book Buzz with Elm Street Books. So it's on our calendar. Please come visit us then. Michelle, thank you so much. Please thank have a nice evening. Have okay. A Good night, everyone.